without further delay, um, I'd like to present Dr. William Leip. Well, thanks very much uh, for the invitation, and thanks to all of you for showing up. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start by, can you hear me all right? I have a really loud voice, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much of that amplification I need. I can't hear very well, but I'm still really loud. <laughs> Maybe they go together. <laughs> well, I'll start by putting in a plug for a new book by my colleague and friend, uh, Don Fowler, uh, this is the Glen Canyon Country, a personal memoir. This is a 1958 field crew at uh, the Loper Ruin in, uh, in the canyon. This is me. I just turned 23 years old. Um, I had two field seasons under my belt, which was one more than anybody else in that group. So I was a crew chief. So that was my first really responsible job in archaeology. This is Don Fowler here uh, in the white t-shirt. So uh, Don was kind of, he was still an undergraduate, but he had some experience. He was kind of second in command. So I had, the, uh, I had the big boat and four guys, and we did the excavations, and Don had the little boat and one guy, and he would do the, uh, the survey. So uh, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's that first field crew. I worked four summers down there, and as, as uh, was pointed out, I wrote some several monographs out, uh, and then went back to graduate school in the fall of 1960 and uh, finished up my uh, dissertation based on Glen Canyon data. So this is really uh, 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 how the can what the canyon was like, what the Glen Canyon country was like before the lake went in, a little bit of the history of the lake itself, formation of the lake and some of its consequences, and then the archaeology. The, uh, the slides here are, uh, most, almost all the slides are from the collections of pictures we made on the University Utah of Utah section of the Glen Canyon project. It was a huge area. The University of Utah had about three quarters of the area to cover, and the Museum of Northern Arizona had about a quarter. I worked for the, uh, the University of Utah portion and uh, was able to get digitized versions of slides. Uh, some of them I took, some of them other people uh, on my crew took, some of them for other crews, but mostly they're from the area I worked in. Uh, there were several, sometimes, some seasons, there were several crews out. So the slides are, some of them are uh, faded, changed color. They didn't get digitized in time, so, and I'm not a, I'm not a Photoshop kind of guy, you know, so they're not, they're not real good quality in some cases, but they're the real thing. You know, these were the pictures we took while we were down there on the, on the Glen Canyon project. There's also a couple of video clips which have even deteriorated even more, but I think you can see, you can see, uh, you know, what was going on there. Um, uh, clips, uh, film taken in 1959 and narrated by, uh, by Jesse Jennings. By the way, is uh, is is Gus Scott by any chance in this audience, or Katie Lee? <laughs> Katie's over in Jerome. Gus is in Prescott. They're they're real pioneers in the Glen Canyon. They were down there in the early 50s. I didn't get there till the late 50s. Katie almost came tonight. Is what? Katie almost came tonight. Well, that's too bad. I would, would have enjoyed uh, seeing her and Gus. Gus has, uh, took a lot of pictures down there, and uh, his pictures are a lot better than mine, but these, were, these are archaeology pictures, so, you know, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the Glen Canyon Dam under construction, about uh, probably about 1960, and there's the, the river uh, still flowing through. A um, little bit of the history. This is a controversial project. Um, the Sierra Club, which was a very small organization at that time, David Brower was the new executive director. They were prime. They were kind of a gentleman's outing club in California. Um, and to some extent involved in environmental issues, but nothing like they became as a result of the Colorado River controversies. Um, John Muir, the founder of the club, uh, had been uh, really hurt by the flooding of Hetch Hetchy up into Yosemite National Park. And one of the uh, principles of the Sierra Club was that they would fight 
the intrusion of uh, dams and lakes into the national park system. So there had been a proposal to build a dam uh, up at, on the Green River or Yampa and Green uh, Echo Park that would flood part of Dinosaur National Monument. So they fought that one pretty hard. And evidently, uh, Brower, who was in the Sierra Club uh, leadership, was concerned about Glen Canyon. They didn't know too much about it. And they didn't think they could do uh, you know, both things at once. They didn't have the, the, uh, the clout, really, to take on both of them. So they essentially said, if you, as long as you don't flood water, as, you don't, as long as the lake doesn't back up under Rainbow Bridge, uh, which it would at maximum full pool, um, we won't fight the Glen Canyon, but we'll fight uh, Echo Dam, uh, the Echo Park Dam, and that was not built. This is uh, David Brower later years uh, having second thoughts about the uh, about the Glen Canyon Dam, but uh, that was the uh, that was the that was the battle of the day. Well, Lake Powell is uh, 186 miles long, a 1,900 mile shoreline. I think depending on how you measure it, I you know the way my mind works, if you if you measure it around each grain of sand, it'd be a lot longer than that. But uh, <laughs> so they must have some general rule of thumb about what they measure. But here's, uh, here's Navajo Mountain, here's the Escalante River, here's the Kaparowitz Plateau, the Water Pocket Fold area, and of course here's the San Juan River, and Page, Arizona is right down here at the, at the dam site. Backs water all the way up to height, really all the way up to the end of uh, Cataract Canyon. So. Uh, uh, it's basically a, 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 a water system project to uh, stabilize the, to, to uh, level out the ups and downs of flow, which are enormous in the Colorado River system, to store it for the lean years and let it flow in the, uh, in the heavy years. Supplies some hydroelectric power, plus there's a coal-fired uh, generating station there at Page, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, that gets, uh, gets uh, coal from over on Black Mesa, which is brought over there on a little train from, uh, from uh, the uh, area of Black Mesa. Anyway, um, this was a, uh, really the most remote area in the lower 48 at the time. It really had, uh, had some roads that had been put in during the uranium exploration boom of the 1940s and 1950s, but it was really a rugged, hard to access remote area with very few people living there. Uh, but now we have uh, almost two million annual visit, so it's changed the character. This is a quote from uh, Ken Slight, the old uh, river runner. Um, the heart of the whole canyon country, took the heart out of the whole thing. Because he, uh, like, like many, opposed the dam, but of course it, uh, had, it has lots of supporters as well, including the people who get water and power and uh, recreation up there. Of course, the lake is named for John Wesley Powell, one-armed uh, Civil War veteran and uh, a brilliant scientist and historian. This is an illustration from a later version, publication of his uh, journals. So these are wooden boats. They went down the whole length of the Colorado system with Powell sitting on a wooden chair on one of those boats, if you can imagine, going through the Grand Canyon on something like that. But uh, they made it. Uh, several of their people got discouraged and, uh, and climbed out of the Grand Canyon and uh, were, never, were never seen again. But Powell and most of his crew made it all the way through. Powell is the one who named the uh, Glen Canyon. You know, he was going through a series of canyons. So he had just come out of uh, Cataract Canyon uh, into Glen, and then Marble Canyon, and then the Grand Canyon. Um, Cataract was, uh, has uh, enormous rapids. Uh, if, you've, if you've been through Cataract, you're aware of that. Glen is relatively calm, you know, no serious rapids on the, on the, the whole stretch of the, the Glen Canyon. Then the rapids pick up again. And, Marble Canyon and the Grand. So in 1869, uh, uh, <clears throat> Powell and his party were relieved to get out of Cataract Canyon and kind of have a break where they were, didn't have to fear for their lives. So he writes, past these towering monuments, past these mounded billows of orange sandstone, 
past these oak-set glens, past these fern-decked alcoves, past these mural curves, we glide hour after hour. Here's a picture of uh, a great big shelter on the river uh, just after a storm with the water pouring over the lip. Powell, <clears throat> August, 1869. So we have a curious ensemble of wonderful features, carved walls, royal arches, glens, alcove gulches, mounds, and monuments. From which of these features shall we select a name? We decide to call it Glen Canyon, and that name has stuck. Um, so it's uh, Lake Powell in Glen Canyon, but people are still aware of, uh, of Glen Canyon. Glen Canyon is surrounded by a, uh, a true bald rock wilderness. This is the surface of the Navajo sandstone, which was laid down in the Mesozoic in a, in a, as a series of uh, dune fields, sand dunes. And those are now um, being eroded out. And you can see the hummocky character of it really owes some of its, uh, its characteristic to the uh, to the dunes, you have all kinds of cross beddings and slanted beds and so forth, which is what you'd find if you cut into a sand dune today. So um, that platform is uh, below 4,000 feet in, in many places. So it's very, it gets about five inches of precip a year, and uh, it's relatively uh, 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 low vegetation. That's the Henry Mountains in the background. Those are on the uh, west side of the upper part of the Glen, over near Hanksville, Utah. There are several stages of downcutting that are shown in the topography of the canyon. There's kind of an outer canyon that represents an earlier stage where the river was sort of flowing at, at that level. So there's benches and so forth, and then cliffs set fairly well back from the river. And then there's an inner canyon that during the last few million years, Colorado Plateau was uplifted some more and the river cut its way down uh, through it. So the inner canyon's narrow. And some of the slot canyons that you see, especially in the lower glen below the San Juan, represent uh, tributaries that still haven't adjusted to that. They still haven't broadened the lower parts of their drainage. They're still uh, very, very narrow and very, very steep. And then you, you get above that, the valleys open out. We'll see some of that when we talk about Forgotten Canyon. Close to the river, as I indicated, most side canyons are very narrow and very deeply entrenched. And there's a lot of water down there. This is a tributary of um, Moki Canyon up near Hall's Crossing. If you've been out there, uh, there's a marina there. Here's a horse and a tree for scale and some alluvium, but it's uh, a very, uh, very deep, highly entrenched, very narrow canyon. And then in Moki, you get above that, um, it, it broadens out quite a bit. They indicated quite a bit of water, the Navajo and Wingate formations, at least in the uh, main part of the Glen Canyon, are the uh, cliff formers, and they are good aquifers, so lots of springs. So this is mostly spring flow. Then, of course, after rains, Lots, lots of water channels down those, those narrow canyons, but this is mostly spring flow here. This is a waterfall at Lake Canyon where we took the occasional uh, impromptu shower. Um, <laughs> that's spring water, you know, so it's, uh, it's really, nice, uh, really nice water out of, the, out of the Navajo. Some of the side canyons had uh, deep deposits of recently uh, in place silt, that is recently over the last few thousand years, uh, alluvium, water laid deposits that periodically build up then they get, you know, they steepen the gradient and then the stream cuts its way down. The last uh, cycle of arroyo cutting was probably um, promoted by uh, livestock coming into this country in the late 1890s, early, uh, early uh, 1900s. This, uh, Cutting took place about 1914, I think, after a big storm. But the, in the prehistoric period, the Pueblo people were farming on the, the, when the valley floor was at this level, and there wasn't an arroyo, and there was high groundwater and uh, fairly favorable farming conditions. Very narrow shoestring patches of land, but a lot of water and pretty good soil. 
the 1950s, um, you know, people, uh, you know, there was mining in the canyons, the gold rush in the 1890s, people, uh, cattlemen were down there, Navajos were coming in from the southeast um, portion of the area. But in the 1950s, uh, recreational um, ventures started in the Glen. That's a great area for, um, for uh, people uh, boating, you know, because it's, there aren't any serious rapids. Uh, Particularly after the Korean War, the big pontoons became available. And of course, a lot of people did it on their own, either in small rafts or in, uh, in wooden boats. But you start to get entrepreneurs like, uh, in this case, Georgie White, the famous uh, uh, river, river person. This raft says, I don't know if you can make it out, says Georgie. She would take several of these rafts with uh, uh, many people uh, down the river and would take, uh, really would lash several of these big pontoons together and uh, take it down the Grand. So she was really a pioneer in, uh, in uh, uh, commercial river running. And as I indicated, lots of private parties as well. Some of the early river people who were out there in the early 50s, uh, this is uh, a boatman, uh, Frank Wright, who worked with us a little bit. Katie Lee, who's the author and songwriter, who has a book called All My Rivers Are Gone, and she was down there in the early 50s, and this is Tad Nichols, who's a photographer, and I think he and, uh, he and, he and Katie had gone to high school together in, uh, in Tucson, something like that. Uh, here's Georgie White, uh, who was uh, the, the uh, entrepreneur who ran the, the, uh, big, the big pontoons, and this is Harry Allison, who ran did a lot on his own and uh, ran really, did, took, really took small groups as a, as a river guide and kind of an adventure and uh, interesting guy. And where's Ken Slight? Uh, well, Ken Slight was seldom seen in those days. I don't know whether you get the illusion or not, but he's thought to be the, uh, the model for uh, seldom seen Smith in the Monkey Wrench Gang. But he's still around in the, in the Moab area. Couldn't find a picture of him from that period, though. From well, lots of lots of small archaeological sites. The area was really pretty unknown archaeologically. There had been a number of groups that had gone in there, but they never produced much in the way of publications or reports. So, um, you know, archaeological salvage was a response. Today we'd call it cultural resource management, but this was uh, this was uh, before. The legislation was passed that uh, made it mandatory for federal agencies to pay attention to archaeological and historical and cultural sites. So it's pretty much um, you had to negotiate these on your, you know, one at a time. So this really required a salvage project, really required uh, agreement between the Bureau of Reclamation, which was building the dam, the Park Service, which was sort of administering the project, and then Congress that had to come up with the money. So several years on the project, it was a real cliffhanger as to whether Congress was going to come up with the money. So it's a, it's a different, uh, and, and it was after everything had already been planned. So we, the, the archaeology started at the same time the dam started. So today, a project like this would start during the planning stage, and there'd be money built into the project to take care of uh, archaeological surveys and, if necessary, some excavations and so forth. Jesse Jennings uh, directed the project. He was a professor at the University of Utah and quite a prominent figure in American archaeology at the time. The Indicated Museum of Northern Arizona was involved. Field work, 57 to 63. Published the survey and excavation reports were promptly published between 57 and 66. And the museum collections and the field data continue to be used for research and education. The collections are in good shape. The Utah collections are at the Utah Museum of Natural History, as I indicated. I went there and you know, got copies of some of the slides, and uh, the collections are available for research and use and displays and so forth. Same thing at the Museum of Northern Arizona. So this will continue to be a resource for archaeology and education for, for, the, near, for the foreseeable future. Here's that photo again. These were the days of uh, guys in the field, girls in the lab. You know, this is the 1950s. That was, uh, that was probably the, for women wanting to do archaeology, that was probably the low point in the history. It was, uh, it was harder for a woman to get a job running a 
field project, at least in the Southwest in the 1950s, and it had been in the 1920s. Um, so uh, explicitly, Jennings only hired uh, men, boys, uh, really, for, uh, for this project. And I think he was probably, uh, he, had, he had worked with, he had had female students on other projects that he had run in, uh, in the Great Basin and the Southwest. I think he was probably, uh, probably correctly saw that if there had been a bad accident that involved a, uh, you know, tender damsel, you know, a, a, a fragile young thing down there, that uh, <laughs> the, the media in, uh, in Salt Lake uh, would have crucified uh, him and the University of Utah. And uh, plus the idea of, uh, of sending uh, young women down to live in tents uh, uh, with, you know, guys like this, some of whom even had beards, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> That was, uh, that was pretty, pretty scary. So I think he just backed off and, uh, and really just didn't want to deal with it. But it's, it changed, that changed very rapidly in the, in the late 1960s. So the field is, uh, has gained a, a substantial amount of gender balance uh, since that time. Well, uh, logistics. I'll talk a little bit about that. This was a remote area. It was hard to get to. It took a long time to get in there. Um, many cases by... Uh, by, by jeep, by boat, and by foot, occasionally used the horses. So uh, the crews I worked with, 1958, 1959, we worked in the main river canyon, the lower parts of the side canyons. Um, anyway, this is our uh, trusty jeep cab forward and our two Arkansas Traveler flat bottom boats. Here's one of the access roads uh, called the Blue Notch Road. Here you can see a little bit of it wending its way down toward the river. Uh, uh, went down to the mouth of Red Canyon, came up from what's now Highway 95 up over the top at Fry Canyon and then down a number of miles to the river, put in by uranium prospectors, the Blue Notch Road. And then from there, we took our boats on down the river. Glen Canyon didn't have any rapids, but lots of sand and gravel bars. The Museum of Northern Arizona actually hired uh, J. Frank Wright, who was an experienced boatman, to run boats for him, but Jennings thought, uh, uh, you know, that it would be uh, it would be a lot cheaper just to buy us a bunch of propellers and shear pins, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we we went through a lot of uh, we had a lot of sandbars and gravel bars and replaced a lot of propellers and shear pins. This is this is yours truly here replacing a propeller on one of our uh, one of our outboards. We had we got uh, some lessons from Frank about reading the channel and trying to avoid the sandbars, but uh, we needed a quite a few more than we, we got. So. <laughs> Here's a field camp. Uh, Jennings also thought that it didn't hardly ever rain down there, so we really didn't need everybody to have a tent. You know, we could, it was hot, and we could sleep out. So we had a tent for the kitchen, the food, and another tent for the notes and the artifacts. We went into town every two weeks and resupplied uh, for food, and we would take our artifacts and notes, copies of notes in, and send them off to the, back to the University of Utah. He was very concerned that those materials get out of the field as soon as possible, and uh, in case we got, all got swept away by a flash flood or something, and uh, get back to the unit. And so the lab could get started processing, got started processing. Our goal was to try to get a report written over the winter and have it done by the time the next field season went around. Of course, uh, in those days, uh, it was thought that if you're going to have an archaeological project, it was going to be done by an academic institution, and uh, students were going to do most of the work, and therefore need to be done in the summer. So uh, today, uh, you know, a project like this would be done probably by an environmental consulting firm. Uh, they would definitely not do most of their field work in the middle of the summer when it's 110 degrees every day down there. But... Uh, we were there in the summer because we were working on the academic schedule. 60 and 61, we worked, uh, some of these canyons that were gonna be flooded were pretty long. And uh, so some, for a couple of summers, we worked in a couple of the longer canyons coming in from the upper parts. This is looking down into Moki Canyon, which wends its way on down here. This is probably the water pocket fold on the other side of the river. Uh, you see a few trees down there, but it's actually, uh, 
uh, with some agriculture going on down there prehistorically. Uh, I'll show you a few shots. There are falling sand dunes here, sand blowing across this bald rock platform and the dunes tumbling into the canyon. That was our access in and out, down a falling, up and down a falling sand dune. This is, uh, uh, those two years uh, to move uh, equipment, a camp, uh, artifacts, notes, everything, move stuff around. We hired a, a packer from Blanding. This is uh, Brigham Stevens from Blanding. This is a trail up the falling sand dune that was in and out of upper Moki Canyon. And then we would move our camp on downstream in Moki from there. Crew would, uh, we, did not, we did not ride horses, we walked, but the horses were available for moving bulky stuff. This is, uh, you know, uh, didn't have television down there in those days, or cell phones or anything, so one of our entertainments was watching occasional flash floods uh, go, uh, go past the camp. This is in, uh, our camp's right up on this, uh, right up on this uh, bench right here. So this, uh, in the late summer, uh, occasionally you get a thunderstorm, and these, these canyons have huge drainage basins, so they catch whatever falls. There's very little vegetation to slow it down, so that can funnel a lot of water into the canyon pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Well, finally getting to the archaeology here, um, there's a lot to do, a lot of small sites. Uh, some we, uh, we did a better job on than others, but it was a pretty good project as of the standards of the day. It would be a much more uh, intensive project today. So this is a site uh, on a bench above uh, a canyon in Moki. Some rock art here, and uh, there were some uh, structures, Pueblo structures, on the top of this uh, talus here. Um, dryness preserved one of the one of the uh, unique one of the interesting features of the Glen was it, it was it got very little rainfall. A lot of the sites in the canyons were in sheltered situations, so there were, there were quite a few artifacts preserved by the dry conditions that you ordinarily uh, wouldn't encounter. Of course, you know, as you know, archaeologists, 99.9% uh, .9 of what you deal with as an archaeologist is, you know, broken pieces of pottery and uh, stone flakes and, uh, and that kind of thing. You seldom find complete artifacts. But some of the, uh, the video clips later on focus on a, a couple of complete artifacts. But of course, that's, uh, that's not the norm. But there were some interesting dry artifacts. There's just a few of them. A, a sickle that was used probably in the archaic period, pre-agricultural period, to, made out of mountain sheep horn to harvest uh, grass seeds to you know, uh, help knock grass seeds off into a basket. And they were collecting uh, very small seeds, but in a big good patch of them, uh, large quantities. Here's uh, one of the things they were doing down in the Glen was growing cotton. It's, warm, it's hot enough down there to grow cotton and uh, on the, the river bottom, uh, there's fairly high groundwater, so cotton needs a lot of heat and a lot of water. You can't grow cotton up at Mesa Verde or in the high part of the, uh, of the surrounding areas where most of the Pueblo farmers lived. So one of the things these guys had, I think, is a little specialty is growing cotton and weaving cotton. We found uh, fairly substantial evidence of uh, that they were weaving cotton cloth in the late period, in the 1100s, 1100s, 1200s at some of these sites. Yucca leaf sandals, uh, these are present throughout in various styles, just made out of, uh, of, of uh, twisted yucca leaves. Here's a, a knife handle. Uh, the, the blade of the knife has uh, broken off but you can see the nice uh, wood haft, and this is set in a slot. The knife blade, the stone knife blade, is set in a slot with uh, a pinion pitch or some, uh, some adhesive. It's an interesting cache here. This uh, dates probably from the, these probably both date from the Pueblo III period, and uh, well, actually it could be as early as the 1000, this one. This is probably Pueblo III from the 1200s, but uh, this is a cache People were traveling through this area, and they sometimes would hide things in caves, uh, and then you know either forget to come back for them or uh, something happened to them. This was a cache. This is a jar of a style made uh, west of the river um, that was full of flakes of salt. Uh, the bowl on top of it, 
and then uh, a, uh, several bundles of uh, basketry splints, uh, split uh, uh, sumac twigs that were used for basketry. So somebody was carrying that through the area and uh, cached it in a cave and never came back for it. But the salt is interesting. I have a colleague who's uh, trying to assemble, do chemical analyses of archaeological salt deposits from around the southwest to try to identify places where it came from and what the trade routes might have been. Some of the sites had levels dating as much as several thousand years BC, back to the early archaic. This is a site that had some uh, late material, some Pueblo period material uh, toward the top, and that's where that cache, the jar, that salt cache came from. But also had very deep stratified deposits. Just a little shelter here. I think people were coming Probably coming down, we found other evidence that people were coming, were cooking, were roasting the, uh, the uh, hearts of yucca plants. I think they were coming down here in the spring when uh, things were, uh, had uh, turned green, were growing earlier, and when times were, you know, were run out of food in the high country, and they could uh, get a little bit of uh, sugar and sustenance by uh, uh, roasting uh, the, the heart of the yucca plant and getting the, the uh, tissue at the base of the leaves. So we found several roasting pits of that sort. But um, it was a dusty, uh, kind of a dusty site. Here's another one that uh, we didn't do a very good job on. Um, this is a site that uh, right on the river where the, um, the shelter had been, there had been a seep in the back and a shelter had, that had supported a heavy growth of vegetation, oak brush and uh, a rabbit brush, uh, oak brush and uh, a sumac and so forth, and uh, a, th a heavy mat of vegetation had covered the, uh, the, depo the archaeological deposit. Uh, but we found on clearing that away that there was a living floor there and a retaining wall that clearly dated to the Pueblo period. I think our estimated dates from the pottery were in the 10 hundreds, what we call Pueblo II period. But then down below that was a stratified deposit. And we, you know, we excavated it, but unfortunately, and we made collections from the lower deposit, but we, unfortunately, the project never spent any money on radiocarbon dating, which was still a fairly new technique in the late 50s, but it was already well known. It, you know, radiocarbon dating became available about 1950, and this was 1958, so people were beginning to use it. But if we'd done some uh, radiocarbon of some of these lower levels, we would realize we, we had an archaic deposit there. We didn't find any distinctive projectile points or anything, and we collected quite a bit of stuff. And later, an archaeologist named Phil Guy, who's a uh, terrifically good archaeologist, worked for the Park Service, and reanalyzed some of those old museum collections and dated some of it, and found that, in fact, we had a... Uh, significant uh, early archaic occupation there before agriculture. Not a heavy occupation, but uh, people were definitely down there, and we didn't, we didn't do a very good job with that part of the record. We did a little better with the uh, early agricultural basket maker two, about 500, the dates about probably a few hundred years BC to a few hundred years AD. These guys don't have pottery, they're still using darts and atlatl. They don't have bow and arrow. They don't have beans, but they're growing a lot of corn. And uh, so it's a, it's a early agricultural pre-pottery occupation. This is a site called uh, Bernheimer Cave after a wealthy New York industrialist who used to take pack trips out here uh, in the 1920s and uh, dug a little bit and basically was just an explorer. So we worked in that site and found a good basket maker component as well as a, a Pueblo, later Pueblo component. Some rock art that dates, this, these are classic uh, basket maker uh, rock art style figures. Um, here's another sort of faded bad picture, but this is another basket maker two period site. This is just a storage site, it wasn't a living site, it looked as if uh, Bernheimer, people had actually lived here and there were some uh, basket maker burials there and so forth, but uh, this was just a storage site where they, they had a hard pan uh, floor in the cave, kind of a semi-consolidated silt left over from a very early alluvium, probably thousands of years ago. And they dug these, uh, these cysts or holes there and uh, 
stored things in them. Some of the cysts were uh, pretty good size. Some of them were small. There were still some of the uh, stone uh, covers that were there. Um, some of these were big enough to actually get into. Uh, I remember uh, J.D. Dobbins uh, was clearing out one of those. He was down in it, and he came across a, uh, about a, a four-inch scorpion. And uh, came, it was like a missile silo. He came right, <laughs> came up, uh, right, right up out of there. No, uh, no question. He had, and he had, we had we, after that, we had to make him sleep apart from the rest of the crew because he kept having nightmares about that scorpion. <laughs> But anyway, uh, unfortunately for us, probably fortunately for the vascular people, they had taken whatever corn or other things they had stored there out uh, before uh, they left. So there wasn't a lot there. Most of the sites were the, from the Pueblo two and three periods. This, the occupation out there was extremely sporadic. People would be out there in substantial numbers for a few hundred years and then gone largely gone for hundreds of years. So it's a very sporadic occupation. But the Pueblo period was probably the heaviest period of occupation. Of course, there's later uh, Navajo, some later Navajo occupation, and some um, historic gold mining and ranching and so forth. I'm focusing on the ancestral Pueblo sequence. But this is not a Pueblo two or three site. This is Bert Loper's cabin. <laughs> this is at the, uh, Bert Loper was a uh, kind of a hermit did some farming at the mouth of Red Canyon and was a very early river runner who died later uh, running the Grand Canyon in his, uh, in his 70s, I think. So he really uh, followed through. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen to me, though. So. Um, so here's a uh, site, quite a Pueblo site, with some standing masonry quite close to Bert Loper's cabin, and naturally we called it the uh, Loper Ruin, so that's where the name comes from. This is me working on a, on a map. Um, this is uh, Floyd Sherrock here uh, clearing the floor. You can see where the fill inside this little Pueblo, it's a little Pueblo site, several rooms, a kiva. It's kind of a rock shelter below with some, uh, with some rooms in it. You can see where the fill line was. So that's been excavated. I think there were two floors here, the upper floor and a lower floor that have been remodeled to some extent, a couple of fire pits. Here's a... Uh, a big depression, I think you can see it in that, uh, which uh, we also trenched. And, uh, you know, it was a kiva, a big uh, subterranean room that uh, was a place uh, that represents the emergence of Pueblo people from the underworld. At this time, it was part of the household complex. I'm sure people cooked and lived there as well as uh, worshipped there, but it also had some ritual features. But Powell, uh, on his journals, recognized that as a probable kiva. His guys stopped there, and they got their shovels out, dug a little bit, and uh, says, from what we know of the people in the province of Tusian, that's the Hopi area, we conclude that this was a kiva, which is quite uh, a good observation. At this time, the uh, uh, people were calling uh, these things as stufas, you know, like sweat baths and all kinds of stuff, and did not make the connection with uh, Pueblo. Kivas, but, uh, but uh, Powell had spent a lot of time at Hopi and you know, recognized that right away. Uh, this alluvium I talked about earlier had buried some sites. Uh, this stuff uh, could build up quite rapidly as these uh, floods came down the canyons. In some cases, it had built up. People had built on a, on a, uh, essentially on a floodplain, which typically... Uh, a couple of people don't do, but uh, they had built on a low bench uh, something, and then it, it had been swamped by the buildup of alluvium. So this was still building up at the time uh, that, that uh, or shortly after people were living there. And then it, the arroyo cut out again. So here, we're, this is the top of the alluvium. We're taking this down in steps, getting close to uh, this kiva, which we had spotted uh, eroding out of the arroyo wall. So this is the top looking down. Uh, onto the uh, onto the kiva, and the, here's the here's the uh, bottom of the canyon. So all that alluvium had been cut out by the arroyo, exposing a little bit of this kiva, and of course uh, exposing the fact that uh, the alluvium had continued to come in after people had had built that thing and had lived there. Uh, one of the things we found that in the more populous areas like Lake Canyon, the communities were not real pueblos. That is, they were not compact settlements with lots of rooms built together. P 
people lived out uh, along the canyon, close to their fields. This is one of the better farming areas up and down Lake Canyon. They lived out close to their fields in real small, very small settlements, but they had community facilities. This is a big gathering place, a big walled area here with a fire pit in the center. This is a, one, a, a room at one end of that, but it wasn't a, uh, wasn't a residence. It looks like a big plaza. And also at the same time, this is probably in the 1200s, there's a community storage place uh, where uh, a great many of these corrugated jars with sandstone lids and some big uh, sunken uh, storage cysts or pits, masonry lined pits. These are interesting, uh, interesting features. This may indicate some type of seasonal use where they were storing things for when they came back in the spring and uh, planted out there. There's a defensive site that lacked habitation rooms, also been used for drying squash. It's just a wall. Of course, in the 1200s, uh, warfare was rampant in the northern Four Corners area. Uh, you guys have been involved in, in uh, mapping some defensive sites as well down in this area. But uh, even though the populations were very small out here, they were, they were scared of undoubtedly other Pueblo people, we, but we don't know whether they were their neighbors or uh, bands that were coming in from outside the area. But uh, evidence of, uh, of warfare. Here's an interesting site. It's an irrigation site based on a tapping a spring in a, pl a place called uh, the Little Rincon. We call it the Creeping Dune site. The, dug a trench along here. This is excavations in process here, and you see the Henry Mountains in the back. These are not power lines. Those are scratches on the old slide. Uh, this is a big tank, masonry lined tank. There's just a little spring there that they, uh, it's, it's dry now, but you can see from a few cottonwood trees that there was a seep there at the base of the cliffs. They're running water down into this thing. They had a drain here that they could plug. Somebody, uh, presumably after it filled up, they'd send you know, some young person down to pull the plug on that thing and let the water out. And then they'd run water out into ditches in the sand. Well, it's hard to keep uh, water flowing down a ditch uh, made in sand, but they had a clever device. They put sandstone slabs crosswise in the ditch with notches in them. So instead of going around the side, the water would run through the notch and uh, keep, the, keep the water flowing where they wanted it to. So it was a very interesting uh, uh, thing. Um, there were lots of little cliff dwellings. Again, this is AD 1200s. People are uh, obviously uh, scared. I was scared too when I went up to that site. <laughs> <laughs> but they were scared of, uh, they were scared of, uh, of, 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 uh, of warfare, people were coming in and raiding. And the, the smaller the population in a canyon, if there's only a couple of, a couple of families living in a canyon, they, uh, those were the places you found the highest, most defensible location. So there are only a few sites in this short little canyon, and they're really in uh, defensible location. Here's a couple of the rooms up there. Uh, one with uh, still fragments of a roof. Um, and we found evidence that they were weaving cotton cloth up there, loom anchors in the floor, loom strung up on the beams. Now, I've got a couple of film clips here uh, that uh, were made in 1959 and then digitized uh, much later after the uh, old film had started to deteriorate. They're narrated by Jesse Jennings. Um, and uh, Jennings, uh, uh, in the film, talks about uh, that the Glen Canyon crew was the first, well, we were probably the first to visit the site, Defiance House. Some of you may have been there. Uh, it's, you can get to it from the river now. The lake comes up under it. Um, we were probably the first there since the Indians had left. We were there, uh, when we did our work there, we were aware that somebody had been there. There had been a note. And I thought that, Jess, that Jennings had been told that, but evidently had, hadn't. hadn't. But um, we didn't know who it was. We didn't recognize the names. But later on, it became clear that uh, some of these early river people, 1952, Dick Sprang, Duty Thomas, and Harry Allison had been there. And they were making systematic surveys of some of these canyons and taking uh, you know, a lot of time to do it. They'd camp uh, on the river for several weeks and just, just explore these canyons. They call this three warrior ruin because there are three of these uh, 
figures up there. But I thought that Defiance House was a better fit, fit and a little more dramatic. So Defiance House, it's been since then. So let's see if the clips will show. In Forgotten Canyon lies Defiance House, our concern of the moment. Here is the mouth of Forgotten Canyon. This is Jennings. This idea of speaking to the public, speak very slowly. This, the camp established at the mouth of the canyon. Starting their long five-mile walk, the crew moves at sunup, upstream to Defiance House. Defiance was very unusual in being entirely unmolested by white or other visitors since the Indians abandoned it. We're on our way to molest it. It was protected both by its distance from the river and by the presence of two very steep, narrow constrictions forming actual waterfalls in the floor of the canyon. These obstruct travel toward the site. Alongside the first falls are some aboriginal hand and toe steps which the archaeologists used as a bypass. I'm using the guy carrying the map. On beyond the falls, there is a long walk on the slick rock. Then come the second falls, which must be bypassed on a narrow ledge on the canyon wall. It was also possible. There was another way to go, which involved going through a slot below and going through a, a, a little a pool of water. But I think uh, at least I was more afraid of the water than I was of the height, so <laughs> we went the upper route. Above the full pool limit of Lake Powell, it is hoped that Defiance can be developed as a tourist attraction when the lake fills. These little figures, brandishing weapons and holding shields, give the site its name, Defiance House. This is the steep slope, steepest just below the ruin. the defiant pictographs. The major portion of the site is in this alcove. There are several well-preserved buildings as well as some collapsed structures. To the south of the major alcove, in what the boys called the annex, there are a few more rooms. At the center of the picture, two men scale the steep slope into the alcove. Defiance House was exciting because no white man had apparently been there before us. There were pottery vessels, whole and broken, and other objects lying around on the surface of the ground. Many buildings were intact. This was a cache of two bowls just a few inches below the sand sand which had blown in after the bowls were hidden behind the stone slab until they were needed again.
you can begin to see the first bowl now. Take his word for it. It is the dark round shape. Before it is removed, a black and white photograph is taken for record purposes. Then, as usual, before an object is removed from its original position, a detailed map or sketch is made of the relationship of the specimen to the natural and man-made features of the site. Here it is, the first vessel, a fire-blackened, saggy, orange-ware bowl. On the inside, the stains of its last contents, a gruel or mush of some sort. Found on the surface, broken, but with all the pieces still there, another pot was saved to be restored later. It is nowadays very unusual to find a site so little molested as this one. This view emphasizes a difference in masonry construction between the big room and the better made smaller one. This is one of the sacred kivas at the site, a circular subterranean room with roof almost intact. To the west of it was its ventilator capped with this round stone. Still protruding from the roof was the ladder by means of which entry into the kiva was made. Here, the lashings of the ladder's bottom rung. At the pottery cache, another bowl has been uncovered, almost exactly Okay, that's, uh, that's the end of that. How many of you have been to Defiance House? Yeah, it's, uh, and the lake is high enough, you can boat right underneath it. But at that time, it was uh, more difficult to get to. Um, uh, Jennings uh, keeps referring to molesting the site. I don't know what he thought we were doing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny use of term. Here's, the, uh, here's a, some photos I found of the, uh, the original group who had visited there in 1952. And they had been uh, extremely careful in all the exploring they did not to uh, take things or to alter the sites in any way. They really were very preservation oriented. This is uh, Duty Thomas, Dick Sprang, and uh, here's Harry Allison, the old river man. Dick Sprang, it turns out, was an artist for Batman comics. So this is a, he was a, what's called a penciler. He, his name didn't get on the uh, published strip, but he did a lot of the drawing. So here's his signature. And also on that, in that 1952, the other members of the party were uh, the dog Pard and the cat Mickey. <laughs> so it kind of just, kind of, uh, uh, disperses the uh, sort of macho haze uh, developed as a result of the earlier uh, 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 episode uh, with the archaeologists out there. Um, Harry Allison, his, his journal, um, talks about Mickey. The Mickey, duty supremely tough, gray and white, short-haired tomcat. He was built like a buffalo, had the heart of a lion, and walked the canyons, wading water with a tiger's stride. <laughs> This is Mickey at Defiance House. So those guys made their way up there, uh, I think partly through the, that slot canyon, but uh, they took their time and, uh, you know, uh, they were, uh, uh, their, their journals and so forth are available in several libraries. Uh, I'm gonna skip past that one and get to the end here. Um, the contributions of the project included discovery of the early archaic period occupation. And at this time, that pre-agricultural occupation was very poorly recognized uh, in, the, in the Southwest, in the Four Corners, but particularly in the Southwest. So this was a, 
was a contribution, even though we didn't document it as well as we could have if we'd run more radiocarbon dates. We documented the Bascomere II occupation pretty well. We found that the canyon was opposite, occupied episodically, responding to regional clim slight regional climatic shifts and to population size in adjacent areas. Uh, we got a new understanding of the Pueblo occupation, that these were largely dispersed communities, not real uh, uh, aggregated Pueblos, uh, mobile households who would easily move around if their fields played out uh, or if social conditions uh, didn't suit them. They had community facilities, but not all together in one place. I mentioned the cotton, grown in addition to corn, beans, and squash. And this was kind of a frontier area uh, at different times with people coming in from the Cayeta area to the uh, south and uh, from northeast Arizona, the Mesa Verde area from the east, and the Fremont areas to the northwest. There are also a number of historical, ecological, geological, and ethno-historical studies that were conducted that I haven't tried to work into this talk. Over 2,000 archaeological and historical sites recorded about 7% excavated or tested, and some of these were outside, a number of these were outside the actual full pool area. Over 35 book-length reports published, plus many shorter articles and reports. Um, if you're interested, I have an article coming out, kind of a look back at the uh, Glen Canyon project, it's coming out in uh, Archaeological Society of New Mexico, annual publication dedicated to Carol Condy, who was an editor on the... Uh, Glen Canyon project to actually help me learn to write, um, but uh, it's kind of my personal evaluation. Uh, the Colorado River uh, dams, including Glen, played a big role in the emergence of the, the modern environmental movement, the reason we have Earth Day, and the reason the Sierra Club is still an influential organization, and so forth. Um, Elliot Porter's book, the Place No One Knew, published 1963, the year the lake began to fill, was a very uh, influential book in, in making people aware of what was being flooded. And uh, you know, a long legal, legal battle went on over Rainbow Bridge, and finally Congress failed to refuse to appropriate the money to build a, a protective, another protective dam uh, downstream from it, and it's had several episodes where water has backed up under it. Um, but anyway, the, the Sierra Club, other environmental organizations grew. The dams proposed that had been proposed for the Grand Canyon were defeated, and a number of environmental laws were passed. It's just a listing. I don't want to read these, but most of the environmental laws we have today were passed in about a 10-year period after the uh, Glen Canyon, after Lake Powell began to fill, and the, um, the publicity over the Grand Canyon dams and the uproar over it contributed to that. This again is another book, 1964, about uh, the Grand Canyon. It was still uh, a viable possibility that dams would, as late as 64, that they would, would build dams there. What's the future of Lake Powell? It's vulnerable to prolonged drought and increased downstream demand uh, from uh, Las Vegas and uh, the irrigation systems in uh, Southern California. Currently at 64% capacity, but we haven't received the spring runoff yet. So it'll, it'll definitely go up as the spring runoff hit. However, it's fluctuated a lot. The last time it was full was the early 1980s. And in February, 19, in February 2005, it was at 33% and 145 feet below full pool, and there's a substantial bathtub ring there now, although it's come back up quite a lot. Lake Mead is currently at 55% and hit a record low in the fall of 2010. So, you know, if we get really prolonged droughts of the sort that have happened in the Four Corners country in the distant past, and we have good tree ring records of it, uh, and if global warming kicks in in certain ways, um, you know, we, we'll, we'll see uh, some definite effects here on uh, Colorado River system. The future will probably continue to be environmental conflict, continue to be an economic engine for the Four Corners area, an important part of the western water supply, a playground for recreationists, a setting for backcountry adventures, 
place of spiritual importance for Native Americans and others, barometer of climate change, and I think a source of new archaeological discoveries and understandings, uh, work done by the Park Service since we pulled out of the field in 1963 has added enormously to our understanding of the archaeology of that area, and it undoubtedly will continue. So thanks very much. Sure. I'll be glad to, to you know, if people need to leave, uh, feel free. Uh, we've gone on for more than an hour. Uh, my hearing is not very good, so if you have a question, if you could, uh, you know, speak, speak up uh, pretty slowly. <laughs> yes. I want to ask, the very first time you mentioned Akiva, it looked like it was square. Was it square or round? The Excuse very first me? time you, you had an uh, overview They're mostly, they're mostly round, mostly round. It's a Mesa Verde style in the Kayanta area. About this time, they were switching to square Kivas. Okay, because I think we had a couple of uh, very late cliff dwellings that, you know, this was an area that in the 1200 was kind of a meeting ground for people coming in from northeast Arizona and people coming in from the Mesa Verde region to the east. So there's some attributes of both. It's a little bit of a mixed, uh, culturally mixed there. Of your 2,000 sites, how many of them are underwater? You know, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, the way this project was set up is very different from the way it would be set up today. The, uh, the park service that, that was administering it said, we want you to really understand this region. You know, we understand the region. And the idea at the time was that Pueblo, you know there were Pueblo sites there, Pueblo people live in Pueblos, that is in big apartment houses. And uh, because the sites down here were small, there was an idea that those were probably seasonal occupation, and some of it may have been. But a lot of it was, you know, year round for sure. So there was a lot of work done back from the lake itself, partly because we knew there would be impacts from visitation, and that's definitely the case if you've been up a number of those uh, side canyons. There definitely impacts from visitation. But some of it was just to understand the sort of cultural ecology of the region. So my guess is about half the sites were directly flooded, and about half weren't, but that's just a guess, but it ought to be, somebody ought to work that out and probably could do it from the maps, but I haven't done it. Yes. Hi, thanks for your wonderful talk. What about, what, did you find textiles? Did you find spindles to spin the Fragments, cotton? fragments of textiles, and uh, in the early era, there were some remarkable textiles taken out by collectors or cowboys and so forth, some of which are in museums. But they definitely were weaving cotton there, and I think that's one of the things. My guess is they also had, could offer, you know, bighorn hides and maybe dried bighorn meat because there are lots of bighorn sheep. You know, the population there was very low, and this is bighorn sheep country, and bighorn sheep was uh, not abundant in the more heavily populated areas to the east. Uh, so I think they had some things they could offer to other people, perhaps in exchange for you know, place to stay when they bailed out of there, maybe even occasional uh, help with, uh, with additional corn or something. Yes, Todd. Great talk. Uh, you didn't really talk about burials. I assume that you did excavate uh, some burials. Did you see any evidence for violence in the burials? Uh, no. There were not a great many burials. We were not primarily trying to, uh, we were focusing on the architecture, uh, documenting the, uh, the, the sites, the housing, and so forth. There were not a great many burials that we encountered. A f in some cases, a few. Um, uh, but I don't recall that the analysis, which was done um, by Eric Reed, uh, found evidence of violence. But I could be, you know, that type of analysis was not very well developed, not very uh, forensic analysis was not very well developed at that time. Eric Reed had been trained in the 40s and in the, in the 30s and 40s, and I'm not sure, he was more into typology and how they, you know, populations related to each other. But I, I, I don't recall any clear episodes, evidence of physical violence on the skeleton, but there's evidence from the defensive locations and you saw the uh, pictographs and so forth.
Yes, I'm wondering, how do they get water up the... Uh, Excuse me? How do they get water up there? You know, these guys were... Uh, uh, the late period, in the canyons, water, there, water is much more available. Drinking water is much more available in the canyons than it was up in the more populated farming areas where people might have to walk a mile or so to get to a spring. There's plenty of water in these sandstone canyons, so all they had to do was just go down into the canyons, same as we were. We were walking, you know, when we were working in the canyons, we were uh, walking in water a lot. So just, you know, climb up to the site from the bottom of the canyon. They used, uh, we found several uh, uh, yucca, simple yucca leaf nettings. They would just tie yucca leaves together, make a nice net, made it a lot easier to carry a pot or whatever. So I think they were just, uh, plus these folks had, uh, they just, uh, you know, they were active and they uh, knew how to get around in <laughs> areas like that. Yes, in the back. Uh, I think in one year, 1959, there were, I think, three crews out from the University of Utah, and then the Museum of Northern Arizona had a crew. Uh, several years, my crew was the only one, like 1960 and 1961. Uh, so there were several crews some years and only one other years. Um, there was also some affiliated projects that were funded by other sources. Um, Bob Lister of University of Colorado did excavations at the Coombs site near Boulder, Utah, which is now a state park. That was not, that was affiliated with the project, but it was not funded by the project. Jim Gunnarsson uh, did a survey on the Kaparowitz Plateau, probably in 1958 or 59, at the same time there was a, uh, a river crew and an upland crew. And that was funded by the National Science Foundation. So at Max, uh, County Museum of Northern Arizona, probably four, one or two years, and then other years just, just one from each institution. So it would be, uh, it was not uh, as, uh, you know, staffed as heavily as would be the case today. Yes? Two questions. One of them, uh, I was curious about that green truck in that one slide, where was that, do you recall? The what? The green truck. Oh, oh the green truck. Uh, that's probably going down toward the uh, height. You know, going down, I don't know, good question. I don't know. This looks like the Cottonwood Canyon area. No, it was not Cottonwood Canyon. And the other thing, did you, uh, did you do any excavations in Reflection Canyon? The number of ruins in Reflection? No. I don't know where Reflection Canyon is. Middle of, middle of the river. I mean, yeah. If it was on the, if south it was. South of the San Juan. If it was south of the San Juan and east of the Glen, it was the Museum of Northern Arizona Territory. And they have some excellent reports and they did some very good work. But we were working north of the San Juan and everything north of the San Juan and west of the Glen, of the, of the main canyon. Yeah, that one picture looks like the, the, Hollywood, Hollywood Bench was here, and there's the big curve in the canyon just up uh, from the San Juan. That's probably about right. Yeah. Most of our, most of our, we, the first, 58, we worked from San Juan down to the dam site. 59 from, from Red Canyon down to the San Juan. And then we moved up country. Any expectations what happens at the end of the life of that dam? Is what? Any expectations what happens at the end of the life of that dam? I have no idea. You know, they all have a, they all have a, uh, uh, a finite use life, but, you know, have no idea. You know, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, eventually we'll silt, we'll fill up with silt, but then someone will have to uh, do something about it. But, I, you know, I have not, I don't think there's any, Anybody has really has a, a very clear scenario of how that's going to play out. It's a long way from a long time from now. Now that the uh, water level is as low as it has been for the last several years, has that exposed some of these sites? Yes, a couple of things happened. Uh, a discovery of new sites as the lake rose, 
you know, our surveys, Don Fowler did a lot of the surveys in the canyons, but, you know, there's very complex uh, topography, lots of ledges. And so he was, made, he was hitting the obvious places. Today, it'd probably be like a really good reconnaissance. I mean, he did pretty good work, but we were under time pressure and, uh, you know, he covered a lot of ground. So as the lake rose, uh, additional surveys were done, and furthermore, people began to find things and bring them in, you know, pots cached under ledges. So the Park Service has accumulated things that people have reported or brought in. And uh, I mentioned uh, Phil Geib, who wrote a very good monograph, University of Utah series called Glen Canyon Revisited, which he reworked some of the collections that we had made and summarizes some of the later research that the Park Service had funded. So, so the Park Service has done quite a bit. Um, and then as the lake has gone down, I think they've tried to look at some of the sites that, you know, the lake in 2005, I think they tried to look at some of the sites that had been re-exposed, but I don't know, I haven't seen reports on that, so I can't report on that. Can't, I can't really say how they handled that. Todd? <laughs> As we were talking about earlier today, there was a pioneering rock art study that was done as part of this project by Christy Turner. Yes. And yet I noticed in the uh, book that uh, uh, Jesse Jennings wrote, there was a summary book about a decade or so ago. He didn't even mention that rock art was studied. This is a Jennings summary? That was 1966. So he pulled that together um, at the end of the very end of the project. and it focuses pretty heavily on uh, the University of Utah that's supposed to cover what the Museum of Northern Arizona did. Um, uh, he was really interested in the big sort of cultural ecological patterns. I don't think he gave a lot of attention to rock art, but one of the things I didn't have good slides for when I made my selection was uh, rock art. And as you know, particularly the main stem of the Glen was a uh, a gallery of rock art. There's some sites here, there that were visited over and over and over as people came through that area. So one of the deficiencies in my talk and one of the deficiencies in Jennings' book is a lack of treatment of rock art. But also um, the rock art studies uh, have uh, improved enormously over the last uh, 40 or 50 years, particularly in the last 30 years, and people are doing a lot more analysis of rock art. Christy Turner, who you mentioned, worked for the Museum of Northern Arizona and did a pioneering study of rock art, but uh, a lot of archeologists didn't really know what to do with it. You know, they didn't pay much attention to it. We documented it, took pictures, but we didn't really do much analysis of it. So. It's one of those things that if you're doing, if you're going to do it again, you do it differently. But that's you can say that of a lot of, a lot of things. Uh, Fifty years on, you know. <laughs> uh, the center and the society want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope we get uh, your continued support by uh, joining. Uh, the Center and the Verde Valley Archaeology Society. Thank you very much. Thank you. A lot of fun. Good crowd. We have a real active... Yeah, it's a good crowd, yeah. They really uh, know a lot about this stuff.